I've been an independent filmmaker for many years and my f main focus is with nature and uh, a couple of years ago I came across a book called Goodbye Tiger, Hello Rat and it was written by a guy with the name of Jan Bader and uh, this story just fascinated me uh, the way it was told and uh, it totally changed the way I look at nature today and I just thought this story needs to be told and I, I really wanted to make a documentary about it so I reached out to, to Jan Bader and uh, eventually got hold of him and it took some convincing because not only did I want the story to be told but I wanted him as the writer of the book to tell the story himself and uh, it took some convincing but eventually he agreed and uh, yes so we started filming and uh, that's it that's, and I hope you enjoy it Yes, I got a call one day, out of the blue as it were, from Mr. Nation, about my book Goodbye Tiger, Hello Rat. When he called me, the book was out of production. The printer had closed and disappeared, and there remained only one rather weather-beaten copy from the 2000 or so that had been sold to who knows who around the world. I've always known that this book should be a documentary, even when there were only 2,000 copies out there. It is seldom a week goes by that I don't get a message from someone, somewhere, asking me a question or giving me a new case study, often as far away as Alaska and the Philippines. As you will realize as you watch this program, I'm not a professional TV personality and I'm not going to challenge David Attenborough's position as the best wildlife presenter in the world. It's also probably quite unique that the guy who wrote the book actually tells the story face to face as it were. And I'm going to do my best to present the case to you in a way that makes an impact on you. From the outset, and probably as we proceed to unfold the story of modern evolution, where it starts and probably where it will end, it's important to be aware that our documentary has no scientific basis, other than the writings of Charles Darwin himself, who still enjoys some controversy after all these years. Charles Darwin plays a critical role in the development of our movie. It was he who exposed the world to the entire hypothesis of evolution. He who didn't only tell us, but showed us how evolution works. Darwin had nothing to do with creationists. He didn't use the development of the theories to discredit anybody. That was never his intention. All he wanted to do was give people an understanding of what evolution meant. He himself wondered why there would not only be one species of snake on the planet, but 3,000. And how come some of them seem so eloquently suited to what they do, whilst others are so modified, lying as some do in an ambush for days. And others, their complete life in a tree. Of course, Darwin's theories were proven in his studies of finches in the Galapagos Islands, but he could just as easily have chosen the cichlids of Lake Malawi or the parakeets of Australia. The question that is often asked today is why evolution stopped? The problem is that while some people, especially when they find themselves in a museum where skeletal remains of long gone species have been painstakingly reconstructed and things like hair and even faces rebuilt, acknowledge that there were one species that don't exist today. And they would obviously include a whole series of dinosaurs which most thinking people agree are hard to simply deny as ever having existed. The issue of how long it might have taken for species to evolve and go extinct whilst an evolution was underway is our problem. We cannot do it. We just cannot see it. We have no capacity to visualize 10 million years. Civilization is only 6,000 years old and we struggle with what life must have been like even 5,000 years ago. No species evolves overnight. Monkeys do not learn reading and making fire overnight. Their evolution did not ever include the need to read and make fire, and that is why they are where they are in evolutionary terms. Perhaps we also confuse evolution with improvement. We somehow think that as a species evolves, it becomes better than its predecessor. That just isn't true. It becomes different, often in tiny degrees, more able to deal with an environment it has created for itself, but not better. An evolved species does something different, 
not the same thing better, other than humans, of course. Fact is that we can indeed see evolution as it occurred and is still occurring today. It is a recognized fact that marine mammals evolved from land animals that went back into the sea. Even we can see a link between otters, dolphins, seals and whales. Somehow there is a link to a common ancestor. A seal is not an improvement on a dolphin. It is differently evolved. It survives differently to a dolphin, but there is no measure of success, one measured against the other. Darwin did the legwork. He established the birds on the Galapagos had a common ancestor, and he showed how they evolved to benefit from different aspects of living on a small island. But now, there are 8 billion people on the planet. Nothing is the same. All the old opportunities to diversify and evolve are gone. Now mankind calls the shots, and the natural progression of creatures, as has been the case for 10 billion years, cannot go any further. In fact, the opposite is the truth. And literally thousands of species, perfectly adapted to live in their environment, are going extinct in the wild on a daily basis due to humans. Extinction has always happened, since time began, and museums are full of specimens of creatures that once roamed the planet, some of them very successfully for a while. The question is, what now? Eight billion people. Cutting the forest, soiling the air, damaging the land, diverting the water, building more and more settlements, throwing plastic into the oceans. Surely, within our 200 year time frame, during which this book anticipates a massive swing in positive evolution, there must instead be total extinction of every creature that does not provide value to humans. Sheep, pigs, goats, chickens. Fact is, we are too smart for that nowadays. And whilst plenty of little creatures conducting their lives in secret forests will just be bulldozed out of existence, where humans discover a creature in danger of extinction, we rush to the rescue. No extinction on our watch. We will create a special habitat in secure places as far flung as Vladivostok and Austin, Texas. And we will move the lost specimens into them and look after them and breed them and believe one day we'll release them back into their original habitats. Just need to wait for the chainsaws and the bulldozers to stop work. There will never come a time in our society where our kids cannot see a tiger, a lion or a hyena. They just won't see them where they might have expected to. Now it will be a special habitat in captivity and not the jungles of Africa or the badlands of Australia. Sooner or later the gorillas are going to get moved out of their forest because they taste delicious and the forest is gone. We will entertain them, genetically modify them and split up the breeding adults into separate facilities and we will not let them go extinct. All the rarities of the planet's creatures will be handled the same and they will stay with us. They will not go extinct if humans can help it and technology will be brought in and we will use genetics and even cloning to keep your favorite creatures alive and well. But if we expect to see herds of wildebeest marching across the plains or mighty tigers striding through the jungles, that probably isn't going to happen. And even though we acknowledge that there is a much money to be made from showing people a wild tiger, we will simply take away their living space and kill them for eating our goat. What can the tiger do about this? As it stands, nothing. He is big and he needs to eat big things, often our things, like goats and cows. If the future of tigers in the wild, living as they currently do, does not extend 200 years from now, what can the tiger do about it? Nothing. He's left it too late. But what if he could change? If tigers suddenly woke up to the trouble they're in? What if they turned to eating fruit? Grew much smaller than they are now reduced the size of the territories they need and simply slinked amongst us unseen. They can't do it in 200 years. It's too late for the wild tiger, the wild jaguar and the wild lion. Too late. But these species are not alone in facing the next 200 years if unchecked human population grows to say 20 billion. There are hundreds of species, if not thousands. Can they change in just 200 years? Adapt and even evolve? Absolutely they can and they are doing it at lightning speed and this film is going to prove it. It is going to prove that in 200 years from now there will be a new world order of animals, 
all adapted and evolved to suit the life amongst 8 billion people, growing to 20 billion people. In 200 years, there will be the same number of species there are now, including the ones in the controlled habitats. But they won't be the same as those we know today. They may look the same, but their behaviour and perhaps even the way they think will have changed. Evolution takes millions of years, say the expert. This film says differently. 200 years is all the time there is left, and for many, many species, it's enough. When will this new way of evolution start? Will there be an announcement? No, evolution has never stopped. All that has been happening since humanity took over the planet is that those creatures who can succeed and constitute a new world order is speed. No time to waste. This film is a journey, taking you through the evidence that creatures are evolving lightning fast and adapting to flourish right in amongst us or because of us. What happens when the planet finally wins the numbers game and the humans teeter on the brink of extinction? Sit back and relax. This is going to get a little bumpy. These are vervet monkeys, a common African species, represented by similar species in India, South America, and odd spots even like Gibraltar and Japan. Not the same species, but monkeys that behave in the same way. In South Africa, there are two families of these monkeys. One lives in its original habitat, deep in the African bush. The other forwent the existence of the leafy wilderness and moved into the heart of towns. Country monkeys are quite smart in the way they survive in their territories. Made up often of some riverine, big trees, some grassland and some bushveld. They are very wary and they know all about the different dangers they face. They even have different calls to signal different dangers, which means they know not to climb to the top of the tree for the threat is an eagle. They also know what to eat and where to find it. By comparison to a city monkey, they are idiots. They know nothing. A city monkey has a million more things to be aware of and understand. They see a child, has the child got a pellet gun or a catapult, or is he bringing a banana? They know every inch of their territory, which now isn't just a large open area. It's a patchwork of gardens, dangerous dogs, docile dogs, easy to open windows, bird feeders, cat food. They know exactly what might be where. They can identify which people throw stones at them and who might offer a plate of fruit. They know how fast cars go and bicycles and how to get over and under and around electric fences. They know which fruit trees are in which garden and they know which fruit ripens when. Vervet monkeys have moved in right in amongst humans and they've taken on every resistance we throw at them and they beat us. So in terms of this film, what do we learn? Two things. One, from an evolutionary point of view, that even with only 200 years to do it in, there might well be an evolutionary development. In monkeys living in towns, they will have to have bigger brains because they need to store more information. They need to have a better ability to think things through. When exactly is the right time to raid the kitchen? They watch the father go out early in the morning. Is the woman still inside? They'll need to know that. Work it out and then act accordingly. Half the population who live amongst the monkeys don't want them around and will go to extreme lengths to eradicate them. But the monkeys outsmart them. And if the experts are to be believed, Monkeys in suburbs aren't declining, they're increasing. Twins are very rare in the bushveld, but in towns, not at all. Perhaps the monkeys compensate for harsher living conditions and greater infant mortality. In a new world order, where different creatures rise to prominence amongst humans, monkeys will be right there, flourishing. Monkeys that have worked out how to live in direct contact with humans in many, many countries on a few continents will make it into the future. But what about the ones we enjoy seeing so much on TV? The great apes. Gorillas, chimps, bonobos, and orangutans. How does the next 200 years look for them? Not good. They have even bigger brains than monkeys, and they can learn quickly, but they're not gonna make it. Too big, too cumbersome, scary, and even with their big brains, they cannot work out how to strike a deal with humans to enable them to live in our world. And ultimately, there'll be no space in their own world for them. But there is nothing for us to worry about. 
We already have healthy populations of all the great apes in our controlled environments all over the world. And we exchange them between the facilities, we breed them and we nurture them, and we keep them amused and comfortable. Our grandkids will certainly still be able to see a gorilla, but in California, not Central Africa. And we will keep telling ourselves that as soon as the forest is saved and regenerated, the poachers and the loggers are gone, we'll return them to the forest, which is never going to happen if our 8 billion people keeps growing. Lastly, in our quest for creatures that might make it through the next 200 years and live amongst us without losing their wildness, we must mention the Chakma baboon. And in observing the animal, we see the real issue of having 8 billion people on Earth. The Chakma baboon never wanted to live amongst people. He never wanted to live as a vagrant. People took his land. They didn't ask, just took it. They put houses and roads all over his territory and they cut him off from his feeding grounds or covered them in concrete. People hate baboons more than they do monkeys because baboons are even smarter than monkeys. They work out quite complicated solutions to problems and often involve teamwork in their efforts to take a sliding door off its hinges to get the food or remove the roof tiles to get in. Are they evolving to deal with the world they now find themselves in? Experts might argue that they are already evolved. They live life in a manner their Bushveld cousins never imagined, and they are coping. Will they be here in 200 years? Yes, they will. They might be smaller and have even bigger brains, but they will be here, with a little help from their friends. Here's another example of modern New World adaptation, and in a very short space of time. This is a Hadeda Ibis. They have the loudest, most piercing call which you can hear behind my voice, and they scream like this at 4 a.m. in the morning. It is a bird of marshland, lake shores and river banks. It eats insects, frogs and crustaceans. It is quite a big bird, cumbersome and needs open space to take off from. And yet, it moves from the bush felt into the suburbs decades ago. Now, they are to be found in every garden and public place, in every city and town in South Africa, right in amongst the people. It surely has already developed a strong resistance to insecticides and has changed its feeding habits to include moist dog and cat food. This bird is an accepted dweller amongst us and it has settled in very nicely indeed. In 200 years from now, when the forests and lakes and dams and rivers are all wastelands, we will still be providing watered gardens and moist flower beds and the Hardida will still be taking advantage. Not only the Hardida, but bird species of all types have been quick to move away from their original habitat and into our city environment. Many years ago, in the city of Johannesburg, there were only three or four species living off humans. By 2020, that number has increased to become thousands of species. And why not? Look what we offer them. Gardens, water features, parks, buildings to roost and nest upon. And best of all, no enemies except for house cats. Take this one for example, the grey luri, once a bird of the deep bush felt, today in every corner of most major cities and towns. Or these, sunbirds, barbets, hornbills, ducks, kingfishers, geese, doves, pigeons, robins, thrushes and finches, weavers, shrikes and even birds of prey. Owls, nightjars, kookles, all adapting, changing their behaviour to fit into human society and not going extinct. In fact today, if you're a keen bird watcher, don't go to a national park to cross birds off your list. Go into a city park or a big leafy garden. There are some birds of prey, amongst them yellow bull kites and some buzzards, apart from crows and ravens, who rely entirely on roadkill. No longer flying over the grasslands seeking prey, they just patrol roads in the mornings. They may not even remember how their forefathers used to get a meal every day. The dump sites alongside the town of Boxburg in South Africa provide us with a perfect example of a new world order evolution. Seagulls. Problem is that Boxburg is 600 kilometers from the sea. These seagulls would not have any idea what to do at the seaside. They would die of starvation. They know nothing about the sea and only know how to survive here on the rubbish dump. Take away this rubbish dump and if they can't find another one, they die. They know nothing about foraging by the seaside. And everything 
about foraging here. They know how to find moldy bread and dregs and bits of meat. Nothing about fresh sardines and ocean currants. They teach their young how to live as a Boxburg black bag gull. From an evolutionary point of view, seagulls are not really suited to life on a dump. Webbed feet don't work well, and his digestive system was surely not designed for what it eats now. So the question becomes, apart from the obvious fact that these birds are fully adapted to this lifestyle, are they evolved to suit it better? Will we need to classify a new species in 200 years from now? A bird called the black bag gull. Essentially, the gulls here are what this movie is all about. Recognizing that humans are creating opportunities for all manner of creatures, and they are taking those opportunities, and they will, over a very short space of time, change themselves to be better suited to their new lifestyle. And they won't be going extinct. They will be flourishing. Lions and tigers are to all intents finished. Not extinct, there are plenty of them in controlled habitats and even more in money spinning private reserves. But there is one big cat that has been adapting for many years now and has proven more than capable of surviving close to humans for a very long time. This predator is the leopard, one of Africa's famous big five and found on other continents as well. The leopard of the Kruger National Park in South Africa is a big animal. It needs to be if it's going to take down prey that weighs more than itself and then drag it up a tree. But the leopard is found all over the continent and elsewhere and nobody knows where exactly they might be living. This is because leopards can change size according to their environment. So one living in the dry Karoo area or on the coastal belt will not be hunting large antelope at all and will be eating small rodents, birds, and if necessary, even insects. These leopards are small. Small means unobtrusive and easy to hide. The leopard has been doing this for many years. And today he could be living on a golf course near where you live and you will never know. He will change his territorial behavior, learn not to call at night, and people will never know it lives there. This is one of the most important examples of what we've been talking about in terms of evolution and adaptation. This is supposedly a Zanzibar leopard, a fully grown female Zanzibar leopard. What exactly this specimen is doing in a shop in George in South Africa, nobody's quite sure. But what we are sure of is that this animal clearly indicates how a leopard can change its size according to the circumstances in which it lives. This is no bigger than a caracal, maybe twice as big as a domestic cat, and quite capable of living right in amongst people without us even knowing it's there. Something lions and tigers just can't do. The leopard is not the only cat to use getting smaller as a survival tool. The cougar, or mountain lion of the Americas, is doing exactly the same thing. And we see many videos of these predators living on the edge of towns and straying into gardens. Even more interesting is the fact that it would appear American householders don't mind having the big cats on their doorstep. And one imagines for so long as they don't start eating children, peace will prevail. In most of the videos, the animals are small, and that makes them even less fearful. For the cougar, a safety line. The smaller they get, the more positive their future is in a human world. They will also be able to get enough to eat as our gardens and parks attract more and more animals and birds from the forest to the suburbs. A smaller cougar and indeed a leopard will be satisfied with a rabbit, not an antelope. For the rest of the big cats, no chance. The jaguar needs a jungle. In 200 years from now, no more jungle. Jaguars only in controlled habitats. This is a dussy or rock hyrax. Many people have seen them on top of famous Table Mountain in South Africa and they are well designed to live in the mountains, feeding on grasses and lichens and leaves. They are well adapted to the conditions and are marvelous jumpers and very capable on slippery rock surfaces. They are rodent-like but scientists believe that given their bone structure they're actually related to elephants. 
We can imagine that these animals always struggle to find enough to eat on the mountains, where conditions are often harsh. At some point they must have looked down on the town below and noticed the gardens and the lush greenery. And they started venturing down to take advantage, always running back for the mountains when disturbed. One day they decided not to go back to the mountains. They discovered stormwater drains and the tunnels running through the town. They moved in and have expanded ever since. Now they live in underground systems, very far away from mountains, right in amongst the people, and they will be there forever now. What we have to ask is whether or not they need to adapt and evolve now that they've found a new niche for themselves. Mountaintop dussies don't swim, never needed to. Mountaintop dussies had no need to consider danger beyond leopards and eagles, now they do. How will they change themselves over the next 200 years to meet the needs of a new way of life? Will they? Yes, they must, and they will, and they'll certainly not be going extinct. In point of fact, they may even become an important prey species for the new world of predators living amongst us. Rats and dussies don't look that dissimilar, and as well as the dussie tells the story of modern evolution at high speed, the rat tells it even better. In fact, this whole movie could be about the single creature. No scientist appears to be studying evolution in rats, so at this moment we will rely on conjecture as we look how this mammal has gone about evolving in the shortest possible space of time. Rats are not specialists. They don't do one thing very well at the expense of everything else. Like many of the species that are going to evolve in the next 200 years, they are generalists. They eat just about anything and they are reasonably good at everything else. There isn't anywhere amongst humans rats don't live and we have tried everything to eradicate them. Poisons, traps, dogs and cats and all kinds of gimmicks. Rats beat us every time. Set a trap to catch rats and the news spreads to the population like wildfire. Don't go near the cheese and no more rats get caught. Rats breed extremely quickly. Seven litters of up to 12 in one year. And that means they can evolve very quickly and certainly adapt to wherever they find themselves living. There are rats living in sewers, on rooftops, in ships, houses, farms, barns, you name it, rats live there. So until someone actually studies it, we won't really know if rats are evolving, but we do know that is how evolution starts. So do rats living in sewers have more waterproof fur like beavers? Do those living in buildings have better developed claws and grasping ability? Are those swimming a lot, developing webbed feet? The answer is that we do not know. But if Charles Darwin is correct, then what we have with rats is certainly what creates a surge in evolution. They change environment and the way they survive, they will evolve. Chances are if Darwin was alive today, his work would be on rats, not finches. He would also study how their brains are developing to cope with the new challenges they face daily. And if, as time moves on, different colonies of rats have different brain capacity, who knows? One day they may list many species originating from Rattus norwegicus. Carnivorous rats, arboreal rats, water rats, all from the same species. Darwin would be thrilled. By then there may even be a rat that preys on these. They will be an important food source for many creatures in 200 years from now. Everything from small cats to tiny leopards, foxes, jackals, who will be forming the backbone of a new world order in our surroundings, will be relying on pigeons for their sustenance. The feral pigeon is a masterpiece. It's already evolved. It lives amongst humans and only amongst humans. It's learned to live in an environment that had nothing to do with what an original pigeon might have done. But that this is an evolved species is very clear. The fact that it never lived in the wild is also quite clear. You can see that just by looking at the color scheme. No two pigeons in the wild look exactly alike, but feral pigeons and those that live around us in the cities are completely different from one from another. So this is most definitely a species that will make it into the future. 200 years from now, this will still be an important component of a new world order of mammals and birds. Here's a brand new example, an animal that only recently discovered how to live amongst humans. These are warthogs, and they live in the town of Hoodspreit in South Africa. 
There are probably other colonies in other towns and certainly warthogs that have forgone a life in the dangerous bush for life in fenced off farms and small holdings. They've only been in towns for a few generations and they are still learning the ropes as it were. But already they are learning about cars and trucks and which gardens welcome them, rooting around and where shopping malls have fresh grass and flower beds. These warthogs have no longer got the enemies of their fellows in the bush. No lions, leopards and jackals taking the babies. And as long as they keep a wary out for hungry humans, they are doing very nicely. Oddly enough, as is always the case in the beginning, when a species moves in, the people are very protective. And that helps too. Run after a warthog holding a gun and the townsfolk will run after you. Can the warthogs make it into human society? And will they still be there in 200 years? As it stands now, they certainly can, because they will adapt. And if it means they need to, they will start evolving. Warthogs are diurnal. They are up and about when the people are. But if it means being crepuscular or nocturnal to get into the gardens once the people grow not to like them so much anymore, then that is what they will do. Are these the only warthogs to forego living in the world for life in suburbia? Very unlikely. But if they are, it won't be for long. Let us move to look at crocodiles next. Because in a new world order, we may find new types of crocodilians emerging to prey on the dussies and the rats. We have been told many times that people who bought baby crocs in pet shops grew disillusioned with them and disposed of them through the plumbing or in a stormwater drain. Crocodiles in general are not going extinct. Apart from the fact that they are alive and well in the swamps and the rivers, we breed them in large numbers because we like the leather for our bags and our belts. But if we have released them by accident to settings they were never supposed to be in and they didn't die off because there's enough food in the sewers, there's plenty to eat and enough sunlight to bask in, then crocodiles could exist and be adapted to life right in amongst humans. And as other species like rats and dussies, they'll evolve if they need to. There is even a species that not only has made the dramatic switch from one continent to another, but will ultimately change the face of its home so that in 200 years it is unrecognizable. This is a Burmese python. You can get a Burmese python in a pet shop almost anywhere in the world and they make lovely pets. To start off with they eat baby mice and as they get bigger so the mice get bigger but after a while they just keep getting bigger and they keep getting more and more difficult to feed and keep and after a while you just don't want it anymore. Then you find out you can't sell it and you can't give it away. So what lots of people especially in the United States did is they put them into a pillowcase and secretly took them off to the Everglades National Park and let them go. Now there are thousands of them. The Everglades is a system. The channels are kept open by 55 different mammal species and they have for millions of years maintained the water flow and the diversity of the park. But the pythons are eating all the mammals, taking over their nesting burrows, climbing trees to take out the birds and creating havoc. They breed freely in the warm climate and they give rise to large numbers of babies. So the snakes are in fact evolutionary masterpieces in terms how they have adapted without making a single change to themselves. But they are causing the whole Everglades to change. And in 200 years, thanks to the pythons, it won't look or operate in the same way. It may not even be there. But then that would be one way to get rid of the pythons. The suggestion is that in 200 years from now, there will be a new world order of animals and a whole range of mammals which will now have adapted and evolved to live in a human-made world. The others will be in their controlled habitats in Nebraska. The fact is that not all of them have made their way into our society unwelcomed and unasked. They are useful. They have reached the end of their own evolutionary trail and they will not be changing, but they have adapted and done so extremely well. The domestic Asian elephant doesn't know where the forest is and doesn't care, nor does the water buffalo. They do their work, they get their food and a shed to sleep in, if they are lucky and everyone is happy. It is not true that all Asian elephants are captured from the wild. They breed and the babies grow up to work. They will be around us for a long time and they will never be going back into the wild again. The elephant is not evolving. Humans evolved it and one day children might be taught that the streets of Mumbai are indeed the natural environment of the elephant. In South Africa we've brought in a whole lot of species not because they perform any function or because we need to do to them what we have done with dogs, 
but because they're aesthetically pleasing. And in some instances, they actually taste nice. We have moved them from the wild into our own form of controlled habitat, a nice, secure, fenced, controlled environment, often even a housing estate. Blesbuck, giraffes, wildebeer, zebras, springbucks, impalas, kudu, nyala, hundreds of different species. Some places even bring in a few cheetah to add to the atmosphere. It seems the objective is not to alter them at all, except that we do like the ones with bigger horns because hunters pay more for them. We move them all around the country into areas they were never found previously, and we vaccinate them, feed them, and control how they breed. This is not what humans did with the first wild sheep we tamed. We manipulated them to give us more meat, more wool, and even milk. And of course, we made them very much slower runners so they couldn't escape us. Having all these magnificent animals around us as we sip cocktails on our parkland estate makes us feel we're experiencing the magic of nature. And we will do whatever we can to prevent them going anywhere, let alone extinct. Exactly the same reason peacocks are so popular. They add no value, but they look great. Perhaps the saddest of all of these creatures brought in to satisfy humans, albeit that we guarantee their survival, must be the tragedy of the white lions of Timbavati. All lions are tawny colored, but there is one pride in the whole of Africa that retains the gene that once allowed lions to be white and live in snow-covered Europe. One pride. Humans were fascinated and we had to have them. So we captured two or three and thus began the biggest tragedy in all Africa. Hunters were prepared to pay double for a white lion trophy. Zoos wanted them, wildlife parks wanted them, and so we began. We bred them every way we could, producing inbred specimens that couldn't walk properly and couldn't see. We crossed them in and out with tawny lions. In the Timbavati, where this genetic mutation occurs once every 20 years, there have never been more than six of these lions. Now, in cages and sanctuaries and roadside zoos, there are 9,000 of them. 9,000 lion shadows that can never be anything except in a cage, waiting for a hunter. They have no value except to hunters. They add nothing, they can go nowhere. One day, if hunting is stopped, then 9,000 of them will be euthanized on the very same day. They exist only because we made them, and now we are stuck with them. Extinction is averted even further if there are a whole array of creatures whose very presence makes us pots of money. Even if their natural food supplies run out, we will bring them food, just so long as they stay alive and make us money. Let's begin with the greatest example of all, the creature of myth and legend, the great white shark. One would think that by now, the last one would have been hunted down and shot with a cannon. Nothing this terrible should be allowed to live. Fact is, the great white shark makes lots of people lots of money alive and not a penny dead. Shark tourism based on the great whites and fortunately some other species is big business today. Whole coastal communities are funded by people coming in boats to watch great whites breach and swim around the boat. Humans are heavily invested in sharks and we will do everything we can to keep them. If the ocean runs out of food, no problem. We'll throw dead cows overboard. Shark tourism equals no extinction. Nothing the sharks have to do except keep swimming around the boat. 60 years ago, humans couldn't live without dead whales. Their body parts were essential to our manufacturing and health sectors. And of course, in some cultures, whale meat's delicious. Not nowadays. Now whale conservation is a massive community, very popular group to be a member of, and lots and lots of money to be made around whale tourism at all levels. Everything from watching them on boats to diving with them in the ocean. The whales have gotten on, it seems. 50 years ago, the sound of a boat would have sent them diving for the deep. These days, they just hang around, breaching and flapping and exulting the crowds to come back and spend more money. Humanity has turned whales around, from once being just big animals in the sea that provide us with lamp oil to a must-see on everyone's bucket list. Imagine a trip to the Louisiana swamps or the St. Lucia estuary without seeing crocs and alligators. Why would you pay for the accommodation and the boat trip and all the refreshments if you weren't going to see the nasty reptilians up close? We don't want them going extinct because then our money dries up. Even if we have to throw dead pigs over the side of the boat to feed them, that is what we'll do. Even when we drain the swamp to build more houses and grow more sugarcane, we will still 
keep enough open so that money can be made out of seeing crocodilians in the wild. How about the Big Five of Africa? If you live in London, you can just go a few miles and see all of them in 30 minutes. An elephant, a lion, a buffalo, a leopard and a rhino. Great photo opportunities in landscaped environments designed to look like slices of Africa. Great photo ops. But no, the very same people, at least once in their lifetimes, fly in a plane for 12 hours, ride in a car for another five, then in a Land Rover through the bush fighting thorns, mosquitoes and flies, in sweltering heat, to try to see the same five creatures. Photos are seldom as good and the level of discomfort is high. But they come in their millions to do this, and they spend billions of dollars. So much so that cattle and goat farms are converted to fenced reserves. The same, but much bigger than those in the zoos, they stock up with the big five, and everything synonymous with being on safari in Africa. Some invest in gold shares to make money, others buy rhinos and lions. The bottom line is the same, money. And the animals are not complaining. Their risk of extinction is diminished 1,000%. There are even countries where keeping gorillas alive, albeit in the park smaller than 33 square kilometers, is the entire nation's biggest income generator. They need the gorillas very badly, otherwise the money dries up. Not any gorillas, plenty of other creatures, from snow leopards to forest elephants, which were high up on the extinction list, find themselves with new value in financial terms, and they won't be going extinct in the next 200 years. Money. The bigger the money, the bigger the voice. Humans control everything, and we have discussed numerous issues in our quest. What happens in 200 years from now, when the population is not 8 billion, but 20 billion? We triggered a new burst of evolution. Because of us, mammals, birds, reptiles, and insects have had to make a plan to exist going forward and make it into a new world order created entirely by humans. We are overwhelmingly successful. The rivers flow the way we decide. We build roads where we want them. We pump as much noxious gas into the air as we want. And we determine how the planet that never belonged to us in the first place moves forward. 99% of us couldn't really care less. We don't even know what an okapi is, and we don't need to know. 150 years ago, if we saw a rat, we ate it. Now we call 911 and the fire brigade whilst we hide in the closet. We don't know and we couldn't care less. But imagine if tomorrow we woke up to find not another human being on the planet. Humans had gone extinct. Could such a thing happen? Well, nature has always been an orderly process. Everything in balance. In any system, there is always a balance. Too many jackals in a reserve, they contract mange and almost all die. Good year for impala breeding, lions multiply. Bad year, lions diminish in number. Except, so far, humans. And we have overwhelmed everything. Even when we've exhausted our land, polluted our water and run out of food, people from elsewhere rush in with planes full of food and medication, and the people struggle on, adding to the numbers. We have leaders who keep asking us to breed more, and we have an answer to everything that might arrive in an attempt to reset the balance. We look on with pity at ancient tribesmen who live as nature intended, old by 35 killed off by stinging insects and snakes and the odd territorial skirmish. And even here, where it is as it's supposed to be, do-gooders arrive carrying gifts that include smallpox and swine flu. Nobody knows how many people nature thinks can be sustained on Earth. And for a long time, we were under some form of control. Once we had taken up collective farming and living in cities and towns, black plague, malaria, smallpox, measles, drought, crop failures, and large dollops of viruses kept us all under control. And we added a few control measures of our own, like wars and later on, devastating bombs. The problem is that we got too clever. And we stopped everything that could reduce our numbers to an acceptable level. More people are born than die. And that is a big problem. Along with that comes the idea that we are invincible. Nothing can touch us. We are out of our minds. Nature will win in the end. It's a chess game. Nature moves with Ebola. We block. Nature moves with sleeping sickness. We block. Nature moves with tuberculosis. We block. HIV and AIDS. Block. But the stakes are high. We want to win and keep 20 billion on the planet. Nature wants to win and restore the balance. Nature's cheating. 
Nature isn't always going to play by rules we agree to, and ultimately we will lose. Humankind will go as close to extinction as possible, all the way if nature thinks we are a bad experiment and replaces us entirely. Nature has tried very hard to get us to be reasonable, and we've always blocked. HIV is ingenious, sexually transmitted, no sex, no more babies, but we blocked and nature lost, and so it's gone along. In 2020, along came COVID-19 and the planet panicked collectively. Could this be the one we asked? Turned out just a trial run, not a dent in humanity. COVID-19 was not the big one, that lies ahead. The question is, if we are contemplating how animals will adapt in 200 years, is whether or not humans will still be here in such numbers. Well, the chess game continues and sooner or later one party must win. So far, nature has never lost in the end. What if we did lose? And the plague killed us off in our billions, ravaged the cities and towns, and was carried in a matter of hours across the four corners of the globe. So, we will have come full circle. Well, not quite. When the jackals die because they are overpopulated, or the lemmings rush off a cliff, or too many pet mice in a cage causes them to fight and die, they do not all die. The stronger survive and go on to start the cycle again. Why would humanity be any different? But who lives? The disease is rampaged. People have breathed and caused more people to die and more. And then, when the people are finished off, the disease kills itself. But not all the people will be breathed upon and die. These are the last remnants of the San, or wild Bushmen in Southern Africa. There are 26 members in this clan, living in an arid valley in the Kalahari Desert. The desert gives them everything they need. Some of the clan have never even seen a town. Some have never left this valley. There are their equivalents in Australia, living wild, deep in the Amazon, on some islands, and maybe even some in Eastern Europe just a handful of people, but they don't get the sickness because they meet no outside people. They don't even know what happened. And suddenly from being outcasts in a society that valued a cell phone and a motor car, they got the continent back. It's all theirs now and they don't even know. Nature would be ecstatic. Now there are far less people on earth than elephants or kangaroos and gorillas. Now the people we thought made excellent documentary material on our televisions got the planet. We got nothing. Now we will be having flashbacks to what we learned in school about how civilization started in Africa and spread out across the world. And it's going to be happening again, just as it did before. And we can begin to imagine that it might take them 50 years to move across the landscape to discover nobody lives there anymore. Everything is gone. The bones blown away by the wind, the buildings overgrown, and the cars long rusted away. So our production has gone full circle from dealing with evolutionary processes that will take place in a space of time far shorter than Charles Darwin ever imagined through the extinction of the species that made the whole process viable for rats and foxes. And the planet can recover regenerate and the whole process starts over again. But we need to know what happened to all the creatures that lived amongst us and to all those in the controlled habitats. Maybe as we breathe our last, we open the cage doors and turn off the electric fences and we set everything free. We let the tigers go into New York. The gorillas are free to go anywhere they like in London. They won't be where they came from originally, but they will be free all of them will move through the stinking cities and out into the countryside. Some tigers will learn how to catch and eat pigs and sheep. Some might not and die. Kangaroos will graze on city parklands and giraffes will wander amongst the trees. Gorillas and chimps will find their way to the fruit farms and shelter in barns and houses in winter. Remember, there are no people and there may not be any for hundreds of years to come. So nature will have to decide if tigers repopulate Europe or are indigenous to America, and if ostriches and orangutans become common in Europe. But what about all those creatures who adapted and evolved to live amongst a good many billions of humans? Some will find themselves well equipped to deal with life without humans. Dussies will have no problem, 
nor the rats and cats. The seagulls won't make it, nor all the pigeons. The foxes living in central London will have to revert very quickly to become hunters again. But for most of them, disaster. It may have taken them only 200 years to adapt and evolve. Now it will take them 200 days to die. All of the creatures that emerged victorious because they adapted now go extinct or revert because their mentors went extinct. But that was never the plan. The plan was simple, reset the balance. Bye.